generation? Yeah, so it's a good question. As I was mentioning before, traditional risk assessment uh, considering naturally occurring falls or equipment um, malfunctioning based on aging and uh, environmental conditions. Uh, there are well established models exist. You can predict you know, uh, the lifetime of the equipment. There are weather models that exist. Uh, component failure analysis, those is, uh, that is very well understood area. So those kind of risk assessment, uh, when to retire a transformer or generator, those things are very well studied because there are probabilistic models for risk assessment exist. Uh, evaluating the probability and also the consequences. If the, such a thing uh, were to occur, what would be the consequences? When it comes to cyber, uh, the probability itself, it is a joint probability taking into account the threat source, uh, exploiting vulnerability in the cyber system. Uh, assessing the vulnerability is uh, well understood, but the joint probability coming from the threat source, who are the threat actors, what is their intent when they are going to uh, exploit vulnerabilities. So the threat analysis is not well understood. And that is what makes it different, although we can use uh, traditional um, risk assessment methodology to some extent, but it won't necessarily capture the threat modeling. So that's where, how do we pragmatically assess cyber risk? That's where the qualitative risk assessment and the other thing uh, what I talked about come into picture. And the other important is uh, uh, cyber layer has to be explicitly modeled in the cyber risk assessment. What is the topology of your cyber network? just like your power network. What is the topology of cyber network? What are the security components? What are that, uh, how many layers of security are there? All those things will influence the probability, not the weather modeling, not the aging of component. Th that is not the factor here. The impact characterization is same in both cases, but uh, the probability calculation is uh, somewhat different compared to what you typically do for extreme events or uh, condition monitoring for equipments and so on. Okay, okay. Uh, if not any further question, uh, we will come back uh, at the end of the next module. So let me move on to module number three. Uh, this is about uh, some protocols that are used in this particular infrastructure context. Uh, those protocols need to be secured. Uh, this is a protocol security. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much of time on this because there is a lot of uh, specific details about what is the format of the protocol, what type of handshake they do, uh, how those things uh, can be leveraged for attack or defense. Uh, a lot of things happening in the industry, the protocol development point of view. But just to give you a quick flavor of what those protocols are uh, in those contexts, and some other cybersecurity issues. So some of the protocols we are going to quickly look at DNP3, uh, ICCP, IEC61850. Those are commonly used protocol. Uh, from a SCADA infrastructure perspective, you see, as we talked about, uh, there is a control center. Under the control center, a lot of substations are connected. The substations are essentially remote terminal units, RTUs, uh, can be talking to the control center. That communication is DNP3, typically. Within, the, each, in the, within each substation, uh, you have remote terminal unit talking to relays or other uh, devices, uh, PLCs or uh, data concentrators and other things. Uh, within the substation, the main protocol that is used is IEC61850. It is a sort of suite of protocol. There is um, MMS, um, uh, Goose. These are some sub protocol within the uh, IEC uh, 618850 framework. So this is a modern protocol. 
uh, it's kind of object oriented kind of uh, protocol where everything is treated as an object accessing the object uh, manipulating the object publishing subscribing th this kind of uh, more like information object as opposed to physical thing so each physical thing there is a virtual objects and virtual to object to physical uh, devices those mapping exists defining as an object and mapping from virtual object to physical thing uh, those things happen in this uh, protocol framework uh, then uh, the other protocol is, um, uh, of course, IEC 61850 also has uh, SV sampled value. Uh, MMS is some kind of messaging uh, protocol. Goose is another flavor of messaging that sampled values to connect to physical uh, elements, to, uh, current transformer, physical transformer, those kind of things, sampled values. Uh, then you have ICCP, Inter Control Center Protocol. Uh, two control centers uh, talking to each other uh, via ICCP link or control center at a utility environment talking to uh, regional control center like for example uh, mid-american communicating with uh, MISO uh, typically like ICCP those kind of links are used so essentially these are the three major protocols uh, used ICCP, DNP3, and IEC 61850. So just a quick uh, intro about each one of them. ICCP is an inter-control center communication protocol used to primarily for communication between control center, power plants for to exchange real-time data. Uh, ICCP uses client-server model. Um, it uh, kind of uses uh, existing OSI seven layer reference model. Uh, MMS stands for ma manufacturing message specification. It uh, sort of um, that uses that kind of specification. It has set of uh, APIs, programming interface, uh, application programming interface using which uh, the applications can be developed. This is the protocol stack. Uh, you have the layer two, Maybe you can see here ICCP somewhat at the top application layer. It relies on other protocol, transport protocol and uh, uh, medium access control, the layer two, layer one, all those e like ethernet, those things can be there, but it can run on top of it. It has that MMS uh, thing. Then it also provides set of application API interface that can be used by energy management system application, EMS application, when they build products, how to access the data from ICCP link, how do you post data to the ICCP link, all those things. There are well-defined uh, APIs available for send and receive uh, from the application to the network interface. Those are defined as part of the ICCP. Uh, so some of the APIs, uh, the related to alarm processing, accounting, interchange of scheduling, some of those things. Uh, these are some of the applications, EMS application, uh, network management application, database applications. Uh, this is how this works. So OSA, ISO, OSA layer one through six could be anything, whatever that is already there. Then MMS on top of that ICCP, uh, on the above, you have the API. Those are available for the application to use when they want to interact with ICCP. The next protocol is DNP3. As I said, DNP3 is between control center and uh, substation RTU. Again, it is a client server master slave kind of mode it operates. Uh, so this can run over IP. Uh, actually TCP IP, uh, that means it is above the transport layer protocol. So there is also effort to, I think, secure, uh, let's say you want to secure the link between substation and control center. There are multiple ways to do it. One, of course, we talked about firewall, intrusion traction, those are related to the endpoints. But how do you secure the communication channel itself? How do you encrypt, doing encryption, all those things? One is using secure DNP3. There is a specification and some implementations exist. Secure version of 
DNP3. That means the master and slave, they have keys and they communicate uh, using encrypted uh, message. Uh, so if somebody uh, eavesdropper or man in the middle attack, somebody is trying to attack this link, they can't really uh, look, uh, see what is going on unless they have the key. Of course, they can create denial of service attack if this network is exposed to outside world. Otherwise, uh, it, this channel can be encrypted uh, for secure communication. That is part of TNP3 SEC. Uh, the, the other way to do it, this link itself, one can have a VPN, virtual private network, kind of VPN tunnels between substation and control center. There are a lot of appliances, uh, security appliances uh, sold by vendors, uh, any major uh, automation vendor, they sell security appliance. The security appliance can provide you uh, sort of put a proxy here, that security appliance, another proxy on the other end, then they provide a secure communication link between those two proxies. As far as the control center or substation applications are concerned, they don't care about they, everything works transparently. The, the secure gateways or secure proxies, they take care of security. Uh, beyond that, it is all same from the application point of view. So those are more like uh, immediate term implementation. Even if your link is not secure, uh, even if DNP3 is not a secure version of DNP3, but uh, that link can be uh, made secure by installing proxies in both send those proxies do VPN connection management. The IEC 61850, uh, it's a communication protocol for power system automation. Uh, this is developed at IEC uh, working group TC57. Uh, this is the primary communication between field devices like relays, between relays and substation RTUs. Uh, it's very common. Uh, this is developed for interoperability and standardization. It is based on client server model like the previous one. It can run on top of Ethernet and TCP IP. So they try to leverage the IT infrastructure that is already there, like uh, Ethernet and TCP IP. These are typically run as application layer protocol on top of that. Uh, objects, um, as I said before, object-oriented substation automation standard that include standardized names, standardized meaning of data, standardized abstract services, rather than saying services. Abstract services can be mapped to actual physical implementation of service. That way, one can kind of plug and play services, plug and play uh, objects, uh, dynamic configuration rather than no, what you call fixed configuration, one can um, have a agile dynamic configuration by having virtual to physical mapping, just to change that mapping, then everything will work fine. So uh, that is a much more elegant way of doing it rather than directly manipulating the physical thing. So mapping of this abstract service and model to specific protocol control and monitoring purpose, that is when manufacturing message uh, uh, service MMS for protection type of application, Goose for transducer connecting CTs and PTs, transformers, the sampled value. So there are three different sub protocol within the IEC 61851. Uh, so it defines uh, substation configuration language. Uh, then uh, it describes um, what are the events uh, that to be managed uh, within the substation. It also supports broadcast, that is one to all and also one to many. That means not everyone has to listen, but uh, a group of uh, devices need to listen this message. Oh, all the relays need to do this function. So multicast, which is a group communication broadcast, everyone involved for protection functions uh, that is supported as part of Goose. Sampled values. Uh, uh, distribution of time sample data such as uh, measurement status and other IO signals uh, that uh, over a separate process bus. So which means um, sort of separate uh, 
signaling bus where this information can be communicated. It supports that. So from a protocol stack perspective, this is how it looks like. You have um, layer two, three, uh, I mean, like Ethernet, uh, ISO, OSI, layer two, three, then you have TCP IP, uh, layer three and four actually, uh, at the bottom layer up to layer two. On top of the TCP IP, you have the MMS protocol suite, which is part of uh, IEC 61850. Then the sampled value bypasses the TCP IP. It goes directly into uh, the layer two. Similarly, Goose also directly goes into layer two. So out of those three protocols, sub protocols, uh, SV, Goose and MMS, two are directly going to the layer two. Uh, whereas MMS kind of uses TCP IP, uh, it runs on top of TCP IP. So those are the main protocols. Uh, the point here is each one of those protocols, they have to be secure, secure version of IEC 61850, secure version of uh, DNP3, secure version of ICCP. Uh, if they are not readily available and not deployable, the immediate term solution is putting a proxy, VPN proxy between end devices and securing the channel using VPN proxy. That is a much more modular in the immediate term. Uh, those are common practice in industry. Going forward with the other uh, big thing that is happening is uh, synchro phaser uh, that is being widely deployed, have been deployed uh, throughout the United States and uh, in the grid and other uh, parts of the world. So how do we uh, secure the synchro phaser infrastructure uh, that is known as NASPI net, North American Synchro Phaser Initiative Network. So network of all those uh, synchro phasers, what is the architecture, what are some of the security issues? Uh, it is uh, kind of futuristic, but this architecture is in place uh, somewhat different than what was originally envisioned, but nevertheless, Synchrophaser applications are being pilot tested. Uh, in some cases, they are utilized for operational uh, decision making. So this is just uh, some definition about uh, phasers. What is the synchrophasers? So phaser uh, angle and magnitude of a waveform. Uh, uh, then you have common reference uh, point, uh, timestamp to measurements. If you see here. In the grid, if you have synchro phases deployed at different points within, let's say, regional grid, they take measurements. Those measurements are time stamped. Uh, so they can take um, phaser measurements. Those phaser measurements are communicated over the network to the control center. The control center has much fine grain measurements, which are fine PME measurement using which they can do state estimation. Uh, in fact, uh, more advanced capability, more, much more time sensitive applications can be lever can leverage phaser measurement data. The conventional SCADA measurements just to distinguish voltage and current just to magnitude, not the phase angle. Uh, uh, so this is done every the data rate is every two to four seconds substation uh, to control center communication is every two to four seconds. That is a sampling rate. On the other hand, the PMU data is uh, voltage and current, uh, both magnitude and phase angles, uh, the frequency, rate of change of frequency. They are time synchronized, and the sampling rate is much higher than just uh, every few seconds. It is a sub second sampling. That means 30 to 120 samples per second, depending upon what type of PMU uh, uh, device it is, what type of application that are going to utilize them. So we are moving from very a coarse grain uh, situational awareness and control to a very fine grain situational awareness. The other beauty is the GPS, time synchronized measurements. That means in the SCADA context, whenever there, is a there are measurements coming from different location, they are not necessarily time synchronized. We don't know when they were taken. They were taken at more or less same time, but. Uh, it, uh, the clocks in different uh, computers and different uh, devices, they are all drifted all the time. Uh, if you want to have a very tight synchronous thing, 
it is extremely hard. Instead, what do you do? You basically timestamp with, res uh, with respect to a reference clock, which is the GPS clock. That is what done time synchronized using CPS, GPS satellite clock and every measurement that is timestamped. Those measurements coming from different locations, they all can be correlated at the control center. They are coming from different places, but they were all taken to taken at the same time. Then it can give a snapshot of what was what was the network condition at the time, at the point in time. Then how it evolves over a period of time, it can be nicely mapped. Then various analysis can be done. So that's how this uh, cartoon picture on the right simply shows the SCADA data is like taking an X-ray, whereas uh, PME data is taking an MRI. So that kind of precise information it produces. This is a little bit of old chart. Uh, a lot of PMUs uh, have been deployed throughout the United States grid, uh, more than 1,500 or so. Uh, they, are, they have to be networked. Uh, the conventional SCADA network is inadequate to support the PMU data applications because the sampling rate is much higher, 30 to 120 samples per second, as opposed to uh, half a sample Per second in SCADA. The traditional communication network was uh, designed to support SCADA traffic, but not PMB traffic. Uh, in some cases, there may be a over provisioning, like a fiber optics links are there, then obviously they can support higher transmission link, uh, like PME application. But some other cases, if they use uh, conventional, uh, 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 some kind of um, uh, dial up or some other kind of technologies, they are uh, uh, in, inadequate to deal with PMU uh, related communication. So uh, there is a conceptual architecture to build a PMU network. It is more like a real time communication network to support PMU or uh, synchrophaser application in smart grid. It's a big initiative, lot of research fundings and industry deployments happened not just for PME deployment, but how to uh, uh, build a network infrastructure and how to utilize that information, measurements for applications, real-time application. So in that context, there is a uh, effort which is called uh, Initiative North American Synchrophase and Initiative. It's an effort to develop an industry-grade, secure and standardized, distributed and expandable data communication infrastructure to support synchrophaser application in North America. I'm sure similar kind of effort may be happening subsequently in the rest of the world. The idea there is you have a lot of utilities, utility A, B, C, they are all talking via the NASP net. This is a kind of conceptual architecture. There is a NASP network specification then there is a NASP gateway, phaser gateway. Phaser gateways are uh, entities uh, just like a communication gateway. To go out of the utility, you need to send information via gateway. The gateway is the one who gets information into it. It's the gateway to the rest of the world. So all these gateways are connected through the NASP net. The gateways also allow uh, their communication among utilities, communication uh, from utility to regional control center and so on. So the nature of information exchange depends on the application, whether it is for uh, real-time control application or uh, related to uh, some other uh, uh, monitoring uh, situation or maintaining stability of different kind of thing. Uh, so depending upon regional uh, control centers, they use for like uh, automatic generation control. It could be an application they may be interested, utility may be interested in uh, some kind of uh, uh, generation uh, control applications or load control applications as well. So going further, little more detail, the NASPNet architecture is, as I said, there are two things. One is phaser gateway and another is the NASPNet itself. The NASP net is data bus. It's an abstraction. It's not like one bus is connected to all the gateway. It's an abstraction wherein the gateways are connected. The gate, each utility has a gateway. 
which uh, through which uh, external communication happens there is a utility a there is a utility b each one has its own gateway uh, similarly on the right side so within the utility uh, there is a hierarchy phaser measurement units or synchro phaser units they are uh, sampling the data at a faster rate uh, old, um, magnitude and phase angle for voltage current those measurements are sent to PDC. Multiple PMU data are aggregated at the PDC. They may do uh, some data aggregation, filling uh, uh, last data, and some kind of minimal computation to do. In fact, uh, some sophisticated intelligence can be incorporated there as well. Then it goes to the gateway, the next level. Uh, when utility A would like to communicate with another utility, then the data is published on the data bus. Whoever is subscribing to the data, they all can receive the data. So it's a kind of publisher subscriber kind of model that was used for communication between uh, gateways over the bus. Uh, the actual implementation could be different. The uh, idea was to connect all the utilities, uh, regional control center, every entities via the data bus. Internally, they may have their own use of PME data within the utilities uh, using that hierarchy. Some other uh, uh, units, they may not necessarily have monitoring, but they are cons consumer of data and decision maker of data, those things at the monitoring station. So this is the conceptual architecture. So what is important here from a cybersecurity perspective, the security of the communication data bus is extremely important. The security of the phaser gateway is extremely important. The security of the PMU PDC device, which is also communication device with IP addresses and so on, that is important. And uh, the cyber security of the PME itself, which is a sophisticated device with IP addresses and so on. So all those elements in the synchrophaser network needs to be secure. Uh, this is just uh, some background information, is a little bit um, uh, provided here. Uh, synchrophaser data applications, more and more newer applications are being developed, more and more pilot studies are being conducted. Post-mortem analysis, a lot of studies have been done. Like for example, 2013 blackout in Northeast United States happened. If PMU data were there, uh, how the, 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 that uh, trend or how the blackout could have been detected. So there are studies to show with the SCADA data, there was no way to figure out what was going on with the PME data, those things could have been detected. So post-mortem analysis of uh, events that have happened, blackout events, monitoring and visualization application, not really control application, but the PME data are coming as part of your uh, display panel. Uh, this is a control center display panel uh, using that as an additional piece of information. Uh, angle differences, voltage stability, frequency, oscillation, all those things can be displayed uh, because they are arriving and some analytics is done, then visualization. Model validation, state estimation, within the state estimation to improve the accuracy, PME data being utilized. These are all some of the research things that have been done. Some of some pilot studies are also in place. Uh, it's kind of continuing that direction. Some uh, Futuristic applications, uh, automated control, wide area uh, adaptive protection, uh, dynamic state estimation, uh, special protection schemes. There are a whole range of applications uh, one can think of. A uh, lot of researchers working on those kind of problems, academic researchers, uh, some government DOE labs, they have this kind of projects. Uh, it's a matter of time, the vendors have to incorporate them into their application, EMS, energy management system, uh, then the utilities have to see a value, then it kind of takes some time. So that's why I said it takes long deployment life cycle compared to IT system. That is another distinction when we think about cybersecurity or anything in the context of power grid. So just, uh, elaborate briefly on each one of those uh, NASPINET uh, architecture components. Phaser data concentrator, it has uh, time alignment of multiple phasers, construct single data packet, 
of uh, PME data passes on to the gateway. The gateway itself facilitates data exchange, uh, does necessary data conversion, manages quality of service, makes sure the end to end latency, packet loss, and other properties, service contracts for the communication is satisfied. Administers cybersecurity and access control. Who has uh, access rights to get this data? Somebody wants to join a subscription. Are they eligible to get it? Uh, subscribe to the data. Key management, encryption, all those things are managed by the gateway, Phaser gateway for that particular utility. And when you have all uh, gateways, collection of gateways, that is what the Raspi net is. If they do it, then the overall network infrastructure is secure. So, inter of course, it interfaces with the utilities own network uh, inside. The data bus, which is the backbone communication bus, wherein the information exchange happens or the basic communication can happen, it provides basic connectivity of quality of service management, end to end delivery, reliable delivery of packet, uh, making sure that the uh, uh, packet loss, those things are uh, retransmitted. Uh, things like end to end latency requirements are satisfied, bandwidth guarantees are given, all those things are part of the quality of service. Then the information security, uh, like gateway date, uh, encryption, and so on. The routers along, so when we say bus, it's not one single bus, it's abstraction of a uh, network, a wide area network. So the routers, all those things part of the bus communication links, they have to provide information security, access control policies, and providing differentiated services. For class A, class B, class C, there are different quality of service level, depending on the depending upon the application. Higher quality of service level should get better treatment than the next quality of service level. That leads to uh, data services. There are different kind of, five different types of uh, service level defined, class A, for feedback control applications uh, like um, small signal stability, wide area voltage and reactive power control, those are the kind of application. They are very high, uh, they are sensitive to latency and uh, uh, they need to have guaranteed performance uh, from a communication perspective. So those are the network supposed to provide, NASPINET supposed to provide class A service for this application, class B service for state estimation, kind of thing, feed forward control, class C for visualization kind of application, class D for post event analysis, uh, class E for R&D kind of thing. So those are the service classes. With respect to those service classes, A, B, C, D, E, those uh, attributes, quality of service attributes are given. What is the latency requirement, availability requirement, ac accuracy requirement, sampling rate, uh, which is the bandwidth uh, requirement and path redundancy. All those things are defined for this also. When you have four, which means critically important, like class A means low latency is critically important, high availability, accuracy, all those things are critically important. As you go down or uh, towards the right, class C, like R&D application, uh, the criticality level is one for all those categories, which means when there is a, uh, competition for network resources, the class C gets a lower uh, treatment uh, in allocation of resources. Uh, that, that, that's the whole point. The so network infrastructure is there that has to be shared among different phaser gateways to support different applications. Those applications can come in the form of class C application, B or all the way to class E application. And the network infrastructure has to provide differentiated services, which means class A should get better treatment than class B, and class B should get better treatment than class C in terms of resource allocation and transmission. That's what uh, this uh, class table defined. With respect to uh, the, some of the data rates, availability requirements, and latency requirements, they are also given here. Uh, for example, class A, the reporting data rate could be 30 frames per second or 60 or 120, depending on the application. Availability is 99.49, uh, that means highly available. Uh, latency is uh, less than five milliseconds, maximum interruption latency. Uh, that means uh, you don't receive the, the packet, something uh, 
last and you get retransmission kind of thing. The end-to-end -end latency is like 50 milliseconds. So you, you can interpret each one of them in some fashion like this. So that's what um, uh, some specification. Uh, with respect to cyber security issues, uh, some of the PMU application just for monitoring purposes uh, right now, and some are for control applications. Uh, the moment it is used for critical uh, functions, then it has to be uh, secured uh, in particular with the SIP compliance, NERC SIP compliance. Uh, some cases, uh, again, depending upon where the PMU sits, is it inside the critical cyber asset or outside the critical cyber as, uh, perimeter, uh, that will define whether it falls within the SIP compliance or not. Uh, then, of course, a lot of uh, smart grid investment grants, uh, they emphasize any new product, whether it is PMUs or other kind of uh, technology that are imp implemented, they need to make sure that cybersecurity criteria is addressed in each one of them so, so as to achieve built-in security rather than just to go and uh, build a system then uh, bolt to security later on. Instead, they want to have a built-in security uh, as we start building uh, newer uh, uh, technologies into the grid. So one way to do is a uh, lot of applications that are currently used, non-mission uh, critical application situation and awareness, post-mortem analysis, those kind of thing. Uh, more and more applications, real-time control, wide area protection, dynamic state estimation, those are critical applications. Uh, they are being used, uh, the trend is towards using more mission critical application using the PMU data. I think this research is ongoing, a lot of pilot deployments are in place. Uh, exact detail, who owns this, uh, those, those are some uh, publications in DOE. Uh, I think th those uh, up-to-date information may be available there. So with respect to NASPINET uh, cybersecurity requirement and challenges, Authentication, authorization, access control. Uh, so who who is allowed to access PMU data? Uh, 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 they have to be authenticated. So let's say in the data bus, some data is being published. Uh, arbitrarily, uh, everyone cannot access. So there has to be a group management uh, access control. As uh, we, uh, there is authentication. Then access control, who authenticated user allowed to access what piece of information, not everything. It may be related to historical information or it, is it related to real-time information. All those things can be uh, controlled. So there are authentication mechanisms like Herbros, digital certificates, access control list, those things used for access control purpose. Then integrity and uh, confidentiality of measurement data, uh, that is important as well. Uh, then the symmetry key-based cryptography uh, is used for achieving confidentiality. Uh, then some kind of hashing techniques, uh, digital signatures used to achieve um, data integrity uh, and other kind of uh, authentications in the systems. Those are all in place. So traditional cyber security uh, technology, IT security solutions can be very well be adapted because this phaser gateway data bus, it is not within the utility environment. It is across utility. They don't have tight timing constraints. They are more coarse grain applications for which this kind of uh, uh, technologies can be adaptable uh, because they are high-end devices as well. Non-repudiation, uh, digital signatures can be used to provide non-repudiation service. Uh, uh, sometimes it may be expensive. There are technologies uh, lightweight technology that can be adapted. Then the key management, uh, we are talking about publisher subscriber kind of model. Uh, when somebody like, for example, when we have this kind of model, uh, so th this is um, one of the gateways, the publishing error of data, other gateways are subscriber of data. All of a sudden, one of the subscriber leaves. Uh, then the key has to be rekeyed. You need to issue a rekey. Uh, key management becomes very complicated, especially when we deal with group communication. Similarly, when a new user comes, uh, we need to rekey. When a user leaves or new new user joins, rekeying needs to be done. Otherwise, forward secrecy or backward secrecy cannot be ensured. So, key management. There are a lot of protocols are there in 
IT security they could be leverage but the key uh, important aspect here is the real time latency requirements has to be kept in mind while we are architecting those kind of solutions data uh, and the infrastructure availability um, uh, this is the availability requirement like we are talking about all those caa properties and extended caa properties they applied to this context so in the interest of time let me quickly run through uh, this one ami security and privacy this is more towards the uh, consumer side as we talked about we need to protect the end to end delivery system from generation all the way to the consumption so this is towards the consumer side uh, this uh, ami advanced metering infrastructure is in place with the deployment of smart meters uh, due to various benefits reduces uh, the energy cost and uh, better management of uh, what you call billing and uh, better reuse of uh, resources uh, both for provider and consumer demands response programs uh, uh, they are in place all those things are great things a lot of things are happening uh, uh, similarly uh, related to outage management there could be some benefits as well so total cost reduction demand response programs are there uh, throughout the united states different stages uh, you can control you can determine how much ever you want uh, so it is more like you know uh, just like a two way information flow from home to utility uh, about price signals about the user consumption profile this is kind of um, reasonably advanced field and a lot of uh, implementations are there in major uh, parts of the world, of the country actually, in the United States. So the point here is the AMI is the two-way remote communication between ho consumer home uh, or uh, business to utility, regular interval of measurements taken, and uh, similarly the price signals can be pushed from utility to consumer. So it fits uh, nicely into uh, smart grid vision, uh, reducing the cost, uh, the customer outage management, uh, load control, user has the flexibility and things like that. So typically what happens, you have electric meter, gas meter, water meter, they are all part of the network. There's a AMI advanced metering host server, then it goes to some meter management data that is in turn connected to the distribution management system. So this is a kind of typical architecture. They use um, some kind of communication network, uh, RF communication or whatever technology that is available to connect uh, those metering devices. Um, uh, so this is, could be uh, least uh, from a third party. So different kind of implementations there depending upon the uh, resources available in a neighborhood or in a city. So there is a consumer side, there is a communication network, there is a utility, uh, which kind of utility or third party can host this data. The actual utility could be the fourth one uh, in that uh, list. So this is a typical architecture. Again, security, privacy, those are all very important. Privacy is extremely important for consumer data. Uh, there was a question about DER. There is a little thing here. Uh, if your home area network, smart meter, you have all kinds of things. Uh, DER, uh, your solar uh, roof or some other thing, load control devices, all those things are connected to home area network that uh, they are in turn connected to smart meter. The smart meter is connected to your uh, back end, uh, uh, whatever the data manage, uh, AMI uh, host, to uh, the head end node. Similarly, from other unit, commercial unit or home, they are connected. Then this is coming to a uh, customer utility side. In the utility side, something related to billing and uh, customer service related thing, the other things are related to operation. So the DMS distribution management system can leverage this uh, real time measurement of consumer data and their profiles. Uh, they can, uh, do better load management actually. That's what happens to save uh, energy uh, during peak and other things. They can plan better. Uh, that is basically supported on the top. Whatever the function, operation function and customer service function, uh, they both can be supported by the same utility or customer service function may be uh, 
uh, outsourced to a third party. That is also possible. So with respect to AMI security, all the things what we talked about, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and accountability, all things are important. The privacy of consumer data is extremely important. What data, how much data to be collected, by whom, when and how, where it is stored, is it within the utility or within the third party? All kinds of questions arise. Uh, is the data adequately protected? Uh, there are two types of data. One is related to operational data. Another is electric usage data. Uh, so there are some privacy policies in place. Uh, uh, we are not going into detail with respect to operational detail. It's about the grid operation, what's the topology, what are the various uh, measurements and signals uh, that is dealt to mostly with the uh, bulk power system. A lot of those things falls into NERC SIP compliance kind of thing. When it comes to consumer electricity usage data, uh, who data collection, ownership, integrity, privacy, all the things comes into picture. There is some privacy laws, cyber privacy laws, they are applicable. Uh, the government has a role in regulating privacy of consumer data. Uh, so, so that is uh, kind of the test bed. I will move on to the next one. Uh, just to summarize module three, what we have looked at so far, uh, essentially, uh, what are the different protocols that are there as part of the SCADA or operational network of a uh, power utility environment? Those three protocols we looked at in DNP3, ICCP, and uh, IEC 61850. Then we talked about wide area communication network for supporting synchrophaser application. So what you see on the top is uh, within the utility, although ICCP is between utilities control center, but NASPNet is a synchrophaser network to connect uh, the synchrophaser application, much uh, uh, faster network with uh, providing quality of service and security guarantees. Then at the end system side, consumer side, we looked at AMI, say architecture, how it looks like, some discussion about security and privacy issue. So let me move on to the next one. Any question, anybody? Is there any question? Okay. So in the interest of time, I keep going. Uh, maybe we can entertain a few questions towards the end. Uh, 